So welcome. Um, we we um, we've uh, started while lunch is still going on. I think so. Uh, we may have some more people coming. Um, it, I'm delighted that you're all here for the Catalyzing Capital for Africa session. This is part of the WEF's uh, Blended Finance Initiative, and we'll hear a little bit um, about that later. We have a very distinguished panel here who I um, will introduce, and uh, we hope to make this as interactive a session as we can. Uh, it's, very, it's very bright up here, so we may have difficulty <laughs> identifying you in the audience, but I think when we come to it, uh, if people wave vigorously, uh, we'll see them. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to um, uh, make sure that we uh, bring you in. Um, how can we finance inclusive growth and prosperity in Africa? We've already heard a lot today about the potential of Africa, and it's hard to go to <coughs> any investors' conference now without hearing about Africa. High growth rates have made Africa um, a very attractive on paper to investors. We know this is the year of uh, the Financing for Development Conference in Addis, uh, coming up shortly in July. We know we're going to have the SDGs in uh, September at the United Nations uh, General Assembly. But we also know that uh, despite the high, growth, high growth and despite a lot of that talk about investment in Africa, the needs are enormous, the infrastructure gap is enormous, and we know there are still difficulties in attracting private investors. We, we live, I think, daily with uh, myth and perception still about Africa, with imperfect information often, and in an era of imperfect information, uh, myths and perceptions can abound. So one of the targets of the Blended Finance Initiative is really to look at, in a world where there isn't enough governed money to support all the development we want to see in Africa, in a world where uh, private investors want to make sure that they are minimizing risk in a world where foundations are uh, experimenting with new uh, initiatives like impact investing. How can capital be catalyzed across, across different uh, players to de-risk and to bring some of that uh, mainstream investment into Africa uh, in a way that help support African growth. Um, with that as the backdrop, let me uh, introduce the panel. We're very uh, privileged to have speakers from every different part of that uh, financial spectrum. Uh, from the uh, public sector, we're delighted to have uh, John Rambomba, the uh, governor of the uh, National Bank of Rwanda, who will be able to talk from his perspective. Mark Sussman, who is in charge of policy guidance and uh, advocacy and country programs for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Sim Chabalala, from uh, the co-CEO of Standard Bank. And next to him, last but not least, Nathan Kalumbu, who is uh, representing Coca-Cola and is president for the Eurasia and Africa group of Coca-Cola, covering, I think, some 80 countries, if I'm correct. So, uh, Governor, if I might start with you. I think Rwanda has been particularly successful in mobilizing capital. When you look from your uh, perspective, what are the opportunities and what are the, some of the constraints? And what role can the public sector play in helping to bring in more private capital? Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I start with the, with the last question. Uh, what would the role of the private sector or the public sector to, to bring in more capital? 
I think there are two ways. Uh, the main uh, function of government is to create an enabling environment. And what we've been doing as, as the government of Rwanda is to, to implement reforms that remove all barriers to private investment. Uh, those who are aware of what has been happening in Rwanda, we've had reforms in doing business, in creating an enabling environment, removing all barriers, for example, registering a, a company that would used to take uh, almost two weeks, now you do it online and you can do it in a matter of minutes or hours maximum. Uh, in, in fact, today we, we do registration of companies online only, and that has been simple and free, uh, so that makes it easier for whoever wants to do business in Rwanda to, to register a company. Uh, dealing with all government uh, requirements to start a, a a company or to just and really start working. We created what we call one uh, stop uh, center within our Rwanda development board. Whether you're dealing with the tax issues, whether you're dealing with the, all the other regulatory requirements, you find it in one area. So that makes it easier for whoever wants to transact, uh, to invest in Rwanda, to, to, to work with government agencies that are, are supposed to facilitate. The same with the getting electricity, same with the, uh, enforcing uh, laws. So Rwanda moved from 143rd ranking as per, as you know uh, from your World Bank background, uh, from 143rd in the, in the world to at 42nd uh, ranking. And so that creates that uh, environment that attracts private investors to bring in capital. And mainly that is through FDI, and uh, we've also had investors coming through uh, IPOs that uh, uh, have been there. Then the other area is government itself is an investor in public goods. But today, it's, government can mobilize all the money. Uh, today, there are private investors that are willing to work, to invest, co-invest with government uh, in, in infrastructure, especially in infrastructure goods. And therefore, one other important area that we've been developing uh, is to, to, to set up a clear framework where we work with, government, with private investors to invest in projects within our country, commonly referred to as private-public uh, partnerships. So that, that helps to crowd in uh, private investment to, to invest in, in energy. We've had a big gap in energy, and today we have private investment in energy and different uh, uh, projects that could originally purely uh, done by, by, by uh, governments. The, the other important thing, of course, is the regulatory framework in general. Uh, uh, investors coming in to be confident that when you bring in your money, when you make profit, you easily repatriate your profit, or when you want to exit, you easily exit. There are no capital controls, so that open, uh, openness to free movement of capital in and out of the, of the economies is key. I, I'm, I'm saying this referring to Rwanda, but this should apply to all of us as Africa. If we want to attract uh, capital, uh, to average capital from uh, the, the rest of the, of the world, of course, or from across borders within Africa, the other thing that we're discussing here this morning is the development of our capital markets. This is normally a channel and a vehicle to, to attract capital within uh, our countries. We still have challenges with underdeveloped uh, capital markets, and I think the morning we are discussing what we need to do as Africans to develop our capital markets that could, uh, one, mobilize savings, uh, promote mobilization of savings and consolidating them into supporting big uh, projects, but also using them to attract uh, capital from outside uh, the continent. So. I would say this is really the challenges we have as, as, as Africans to remove all the barriers. Like today, we talk of uh, Africa investment or Africa investing, Africans investing in African countries. We still have barriers even for, for Africans investing in African countries. Uh, and we are saying, uh, taking an example of East Africa, where we are opening up our borders to free movement of capital between all the African, the East African countries, from movement of uh, labor, and from movement of people in general. So that will really catalyze uh, capital and move capital from where, 
it is wet, it, it has a, a good impact on the ground, but also for the investors to, to, to get good uh, returns on their investment. So briefly, that's what I would say for now. Uh, I'll be happy to come back to, to answer any further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Nathan, um, the governor has identified, I think, many of the many of the issues that are identified in the doing business report, predictability, um, ease with registration, uh, open, open um, access. From the point of view of Coca-Cola, when you go in and you want to invest, what are the issues that you are looking for? And what, 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 is, what can government do to reduce that cost of doing business? Yeah, thank you. Um, our system has been on the African continent since 1928, and um, we, we basically, you know, have uh, built a business that is a very local, local approach. Um, we, we we do have over 145 production facilities all over Africa, and employ over over 70 70,000 people. And as we have gone through Africa through the years. Um, we have garnered a number of experiences, and um, you know, we do see significant progress being made in the areas that the governor has referred to in the area of infrastructure. We see significant progress being made in infrastructure development. We believe that there is still a lot of work to be done in infrastructure. When you look at our rail, our road networks, uh, you look at our communication, um, you look at our education systems, there is, there is a lot that, that still needs to be done. In fact, uh, recent estimates I looked at you know, were saying that we probably have an infrastructure deficit of close to double what we are currently investing. Um, and, and, and this is very important for our systems. We have had, in some cases, where we have challenges, especially with distribution infrastructure, created homemade models that are called micro distribution centers. We have across Africa about 3,500 micro distribution centers that are really focused on accessing remote communities where otherwise we would not be able to reach with the difficult infrastructure that we currently have. And these are local distribution facilities run by locals helping us reach, reach far, -flung, far flung communities. We have also you know, garnered a number of experiences over the last 87 years as we drive this, what we call, you know, you know, locally sourced, local hiring, local manufacturing, very local type of business. And then that experience is, is really around, you know, public-private sector partnerships. And I think the governor alluded to that as well. You know, when you look at the challenges and the opportunities that Africa faces, it is very clear that these challenges cannot be addressed and cannot be resolved by any single entity or any single organization. What we've realized over the years is that partnerships between government, civil society, uh, and then the private sector are very critical to addressing the many challenges that we face, in some cases very complex challenges uh, within the continent. I will give you an example of a public-private sector partnership that we have um, implemented in East Africa. And this is a partnership that we entered in with the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, <coughs> uh, John's organization. And um, it, we also went into this partnership together with the government of Kenya and the government of Uganda. Um, they were part of the steering committee of this organization. And we also worked with technical partners in education with TechnoSef. And our focus here was on fruit farmers. At the end of the day, we have realized as an organization working across Africa that we cannot disassociate our progress with community's progress. That is the strength and sustainability of our business is very anchored on the strength and sustainability of our communities. So as we continue to strengthen our value chains, we look for opportunities to strengthen communities at the same time. And we worked with these three partners to work with 53,000 farmers across East, and, uh, East Africa, across basically Kenya and Tanzania. And the focus of the program was really to help them improve you know, the quality of their output, the productivity of their farms, and also give them access to our supply chain. 
So what we achieved at the end of the day is we were able to double the revenues of the communities that are producing you know, fruits, mango and passion in small farms, whilst at the same time giving them access to our value chain. And we were able to have a sustainable access to fruits that are important in our food business. So, so we really believe that this, this partnership that is between government, private, and, and, non, and, 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 and civil society, you know, to make progress in Africa is, is very, very important, given the, just the, the enormity of the opportunity, and in some cases, the complexity of the challenges that we face. I think I'll leave it there, you know, at, at, at this point. Okay, thank yeah. you. Sim, Nathan um, underscored the role of the community, the role of the locality in both the supply chain in, and as part of this partnership and also triangular partnership with government. Um, Standard Bank is one of the largest financial institutions in Africa. I think you're, you're present in some 19 countries. What, um, what is the role of the locality in terms of financing opportunities and partnerships that the, the, the financial sector can bring to bear for some of these issues, including some of the most uh, difficult issues to mobilize finance around, such as infrastructure? Yes, I do think um, it is a, it's a true statement of fact that uh, the continent suffers from a severe deficit of infrastructure. So I agree entirely with, uh, with, with Nathan. It is also true that um, we have amongst the lowest investment to GDP ratios uh, amongst all the regions at about 22%, um, which suggests that there are huge opportunities to uh, execute projects and investments uh, that are developmental in nature but give rise to returns that adequately um, remunerate those who are willing to take risk on those projects. As far as taking those kinds of risks are concerned, uh, investors would do well to partner with local players. Um, and if I could use three examples to illustrate that point, to underscore what the governor was saying and what Nathan was saying. The first example is President Obama's Power Africa initiative. Um, mobilizing $7 billion to be leveraged for the purposes of energy infrastructure on the continent. We're involved in a number of those projects in at least four countries, uh, being Nigeria, uh, Tanzania, Ghana, um, and Kenya. And that is a classic example of mobilizing uh, not just capital, but also know-how, policy advice, uh, legal structuring, um, thinking through the types of contracts that work for those kinds of projects, uh, and thereby mobilizing uh, uh, American resources, the likes of General Electric, uh, as well as local resources, for example, in our case, where we've got uh, several hundred million dollars in, uh, invested in those projects. So that's the first example. The second example I would like to use is, is a South African one, which is the Renewable Energy uh, Power Producer Procurement Program. Uh, in South Africa. Um, our competitors together with ourselves have in effect entered into partnerships that have made a significant difference to South Africa's um, energy deficit. Um, and that has happened because of great partnerships between ourselves, uh, government, and also uh, project sponsors, many of whom are international illustrating the point uh, that it's important to have local partners. The third and last example I'd like to refer to is the clean, uh, develop, clean development mechanism where uh, uh, governments can have access to products that we offer in carbon trading and def therefore generate revenues which they otherwise would not generate uh, as a consequence <coughs> of being involved with us. Uh, one example where uh, communities have benefited there is the Nelson Mandela uh, municipality where uh, as a consequence of the CDM we've put in place there, uh, the community has 110,000 uh, solar water heaters uh, at a price acceptable to, to, to the community. Perhaps I should leave it there with those three examples. Okay, thank you. Um, finally, <coughs> um, 
mark um, philanthropy and indeed private wealth. We see an enormous amount globally of private wealth. Um, we know that um, $31 trillion is going to pass down to the millennial generation. We also know that philanthropists are now talking about smart <coughs> philanthropy in ways they perhaps never did before and moving into impact investing and very savvy partnerships across public, private. Why do you and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation see the philanthropic angle to this? And, and how in an in a age and an era where we know Africa is becoming a pole of growth, how can we help to get, both get that message across but also mobilize the private wealth that's now out there? Well, thank you. And yes, from the, the Gates Foundation's perspective, we see a, a critical role of philanthropic <coughs> capital in trying to look for what's the comparative advantage of philanthropic capital against the other pools of your know, traditional public sector capital, private sector capital. And we see it really as ideally it's uh, a catalyst to leverage in broad capital against a particular type of return. In this case, it tends to be a return on, on human capital and human investments. In our case, we look in particular areas like health and agriculture. Um, you've heard one example already in the case of our partnership with Coca-Cola. And there, that was some use, a modest amount of grant money on our side, a, a great partner in, in Coke and, and the respective governments. But essentially, the market failure there was that Coke was uh, having, as I understand, the, having to import the, basically, the fruit to do the fruit juices when actually there's a clear comparative advantage that it should be being grown locally. But we need some connection to make that access to the local markets and to do it in a way that and this is where our thing comes in, to make sure it's empowering local smallholder farmers, which has the greatest poverty-reducing impact. And so there are a number of those examples across the agriculture and health spaces where we operate, and we'll use grant resources directly, and uh, we've invested somewhere over $600 million last year in, in, in Africa in, in traditional grants, but we also use our balance sheet, uh, and that's in terms of providing both things like guarantees, uh, to, to get volume supply in terms of direct equity investments occasionally. And so we've worked in areas and we have a, a partnership. We've had an initial partnership with developing a, a newer one with the Braj Capital to invest in uh, healthcare delivery services across Africa. And again, these are areas where our resources can come in and basically incentivize you to help prove the model and show that there is a long-term sustainable economic model then private finance can come in, can help drive, and then make that sustainable over the longer term. Uh, and as I say, there, there are a number of those areas and examples where I think historically it's been challenging, especially in these kind of sectors. You know, in Africa, again, historically it's been a little easier to mobilize resources in traditional natural resource uh, investments and other really highly big capital intensive uh, investments like that because the returns are so clear. These are more complex markets, uh, the kind of ones I'm talking about, particularly when you're marketing more towards the bottom of the, the pyramid, both in terms of consumers, but you're also trying to, to draw in suppliers. And so, uh, but I think the, the net result, and we now have several years of, of doing this, is there are clear successful models that can draw this in, that are sustainable over the long term, uh, and that hopefully those are models that can attract in both other philanthropic examples, but ultimately private capital over the longer term. So successful models, but perhaps I could challenge you all, and I'm going to go to the audience in a minute. Um, you're all making it sound very easy. Uh, put in place the right regulations, have uh, some creative public-private partnerships, bring in the community, and, and the investment will follow. And yet we know that if we take infrastructure, for example, the gap is huge, and we have development banks, and we're going to have new, the BRICS Bank, and uh, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, but still it's very difficult to get even the upfront money to pay for feasibility studies, which is, I think, 10% of the total cost. So uh, there's something going on here that isn't, seems to me, that is more than perhaps we're 
identifying here, and I want to challenge you on that and come back to you on that. But let me first uh, come to the floor and see if we have um, if we have any interventions from the floor at this point. Comments, questions. Yes, sir, in the second row. Gilma Slati from African Financial Group in South Africa. My, my experience is, is people. I mean, you can come with money, you can come with systems, you need the people. Uh, and that's, I've been investing in Nigeria for some time now, uh, three to five years. And uh, the challenge is getting the right people. How do, you, how do you deal with that? Thank you. Should we take another, another question from the floor? Yes, sir, in the fourth row there. A microphone is coming. Hi, my name is Jude Kearney. I'm a lawyer from Washington, D.C. I used to um, run an office uh, of a law firm here in South Africa. One of the impediments I remember from South Africa in particular, but I think that it has grown to the rest of Africa, deals with local content. Um, that's sort of considered, I think, BEE here in, here in South Africa, but local content tends to be an important, uh, but sometimes debilitating uh, impact on investors, and I wanted to get some feedback as to uh, the panelists' view on that. In the front, here. Hi, I'm Lucy Fonseca. I'm a global shaper from the Praia Hub. Um, and I'd like to ask the panel um, what their thoughts are on whether enough is being done to uh, innovate asset classes for this particular challenge that we have. Um, and it, uh, if so, which asset classes are you most optimistic about that, that can best be sort of uh, adapted and optimized for the challenges that we're talking about on the African continent? So, Governor, perhaps I could begin with you. Mm. I think three very important points. Uh, the people, it's about human dimension. The local context that we've also heard about and innovation around asset classes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the, the people, I think the, the question on, on who we deal with, that's key because we we are desperate to get this capital. At times, we have crooks presenting themselves as, as investors, and this has been more costly than not having the capital. Mm. So that has been a challenge in many African countries. But, but also, this goes back to our capacities to, to engage uh, with the international community or with the, the would-be investors. So as we talk of the policies, the uh, the, the, the enabling environment, I think building capacities of uh, government officials uh, to deal, to engage with, uh, with the rest, with investors, uh, to be specific, is key uh, to uh, catalyzing investment or capital too. So one, it's, it's key because the, the good investors will not waste time with people who don't know what they want, uh, therefore they, won't, they will, don't come, but then uh, weak uh, capacities also uh, won't be able to identify and, and isolate the, uh, the, the, the pretenders to be investors who are really... Uh, so that has been a challenge to, 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 to us, and this is something we, we have to deal with. Uh, at least it's important to know that it's a challenge, and therefore as we, we are looking for capital, you, you don't just welcome any Tom and Dick that... Uh, pretends to be bringing capital. Uh, and so that has been a challenge. And uh, it, it goes beyond the capacities also, but dealing with the issues of corruption as well within our uh, countries, uh, that has a hand in uh, us at the end of the day accepting uh, uh, crooks because they're, they're, they're giving some kickbacks, and that at the end of the day is really costly to, to, the, to the economies more than anything else. So 
I think one is the capacities, but also fighting corruption. Uh, and that has been another uh, limiting factor. Uh, as we said, uh, also really bona fide investors will not be ready to, to be corrupt. Uh, and this will be uh, uh, really driven away by corrupt officials. So that's important. And that's key, at least based on uh, our country, we, we have this policy of zero tolerance to corruption. And we know it matters a lot. The, the different reforms we are making will not succeed if we don't fight that, uh, fight corruption as well. So I, I would just say we, it's really building up, knowing what we want and being able to stand on our feet and negotiate on equal terms with whoever is bringing capital. And we avoid to move in as, as desperate uh, uh, people. So I think that's key. On local content, maybe uh, my colleague from South Africa will say more on that, but for us, we don't, we don't require that. We, you come in with capital, you, you own your business 100%, uh, you just have to follow the normal uh, rules of the game. So we don't require any, uh, any local content. And I think uh, I, was, I was talking to some guy who knew Singapore, much better than many other people, and we were saying the, the good thing with Singapore is it's open. It's you walk in with any money you, you, you have, you do business, and you go out with any man at any time you want. So it's that free uh, entry and exit at the end of the day, what's left behind is much more than what will be taken out. And I think if we don't open up as, as, uh, as Africans, we capital always remain shy uh, to, to come to us. Uh, so I think that's key. And uh, South Africa has its own historical problems. I think that's why they had to, to, to move to the direction, take the direction they took. But I think it's in general, we, we should welcome investors without having to, because at the end of the day, you, you, you force uh, local content on, on them. And when they want to raise more capital, the, the local partner is not in position to, to raise more capital. So there are different factors that act as, as hindrances to, to investors. So from our end, I think it's, we should really uh, uh, discourage that. Uh, then on uh, innovation on assets, uh, Maybe I leave that to, to, yeah. to, the, to the banker who deals with the assets directly. Uh, so anyway, but let, let me let the others uh, handle So the that's a good seg segue, Sam. Um, yeah. So um, asset classes. Asset classes. Well, yeah, let me start with asset classes. I think it is true that there is great opportunity to innovate at a number of different levels. Firstly, there is a lot of money in the diaspora, and so one can envisage uh, uh, um, instruments that appeal to the diaspora and can be used for, for that purpose. One can also envisage a situation where you use uh, mechanisms that uh, tap into human solidarity um, and include those as part of the, fun, uh, of the bonds or the instruments that, uh, that one issues. But fundamentally, what the continent needs to do is to build its financial infrastructure and deepen financialization by putting in place the appropriate reg regulatory mechanisms, such as pension fund reforms, insurance, uh, insurance legislation, uh, and then let governments issue bonds so that you uh, increase the, the depth of the capital markets. So yes, there is room for, for, for innovation, but I would argue that it's incumbent on us as Africans to, to build uh, the, the infrastructure uh, ourselves. Secondly, on human capital, uh, there is one a remarkable thing in my view about Nigeria and that is the fact that to the extent that the Nigerians can capitalize on the demographic dividend, that economy could easily double uh, in, a, in, in a very short space of time. And one hears the authorities speak of what needs to be done for that purpose, which is uh, fixed education, fixed health care and so forth, uh, and therefore uh, uh, improve uh, the human capital in, in Nigeria. The third point on uh, local content, it is true that local content can give rise to undesirable outcomes. Requirements for local content can give rise to undesirable outcomes, but there are examples where the outcomes have been fantastic in South Africa. 
where the relevant legislation has been implemented or the policy has been implemented with discipline, the outcomes have been wonderful. If I could use just one example, uh, Transnet is busy rolling out uh, its uh, market demand strategy. It is a fantastic strategy um, meant to uh, fix the country's logistics system. A large component of it uh, requires local content and GE, as well as the Chinese partners uh, that are working with Transnet, uh, have been happily participating uh, in, in that arrangement uh, and allowing for, for local content. There are other countries on the continent that require it. Uh, Angola requires uh, a form of indigenization, so does Nigeria and so forth. So the real test is, does the introduction of a requirement for local content give rise to unacceptable rent seeking and to the extent that it does, what are the checks and balances that are in place to, uh, to, to prevent it? I think it's unavoidable given the, the history of our continent that people will demand it. The question is, what does it do to the cost of finance and what does it do to corruption and how do you prevent uh, the, the corruption? <coughs> Related to that, perhaps I can pose a question to all of you. So much of this discussion is predicated on public private partnerships, the government playing one role, private sector another role. Is there still too much of an ideological divide between those two sectors? Are we still in a place where people are hesitant to partner in certain areas, education, healthcare, particularly relevant for the um, uh, Gates Foundation? When we had a discussion on blended finance at Davos, it was very interesting there was a feeling there were certain areas that the private sector are inappropriate for the private sector to go, and certain areas where the government is, is perhaps reluctant to partner with the private sector. Do we still have work to do about that, what used to be quite a chasm between public and private? Nathan. Yeah, that's a very good question, uh, Carolyn. You know, you know, it links very much into the question on people, which I think is a fundamental, a fundamental question. When you really look at the African continent, we are a very young continent. 65% of our population is below the age of 35. And this is a resource that we have to leverage as Africa and a resource that we cannot leave untapped. Um, and the only way that I believe this resource can be fully tapped is through integrated partnerships. I do not think that businesses alone will be able to address the issue of people <coughs> that, that you are raising. Uh, it, it needs to involve government institutions, it needs to involve civil society. What you're seeing as a big challenge in improving the pool of talented resources on the continent is that some of the education systems are not really aligned with the needs of industry. So need for there to be much more collaboration between government, between these tertiary institutions and industry in building talent that is tailored to where the industry is going. And when you go into some of the institutions on the continent, you look at the equipment, you look at the technology being used, you look at the computers that are being used, they're very divorced to where the world is going. So there's need to really connect where industry is going with where government is going from an infrastructure development standpoint. And then the other element that I think is important is <coughs> when you look, look at this young population, when you look at the youth, you know, that are unemployed or underemployed, um, it's, it's, it's really disheartening. You know, we, we are in a business in, in the Coca-Cola system, which, is called, which, is, which I would call a street-level business. You know, we deliver to local villages, to local communities, to local townships, to local cities, and every day we see these young people who have a lot of ambition, who have a lot of expectation, but have no opportunity. And one of the things that I am really pleased to share with you today as a contribution that our system is making in order to try and create models that may be replicated and, and scaled in the future to address youth unemployment is we've created an organization that is called Youth Empowered for Success, YES program. And this program, we're actually launching it today, and the program is going to target 25,000 youth in three countries. And the focus of this program is, is really on training life skills, business skills, giving the youth access to entrepreneurial opportunities, 
giving the youth access to job through our ecosystem because we've got a huge ecosystem um, you know, that we can leverage to, to give opportunities to youth. And whilst at the same time, you know, making sure that these youth are connected through an e-mentoring program. We've pulled together a number of partners. And again, this overemphasizes the point that I think is, is very important for Africa to make progress around this partnership. It's even more important for Africa you know, to establish effective, strong partnerships that can make things happen. What we are trying to model and what we have created is a partnership with Harambe, Youth, youth Empowerment you know, uh, Calibrate you know, you know, Incubator, which is an organization that focuses on youth, youth unemployment. We have partnered with Kuzi Biashara from Kenya, which is again an organization that focuses on youth employment. And we've partnered with Microsoft you know, on the e-mentoring program and e-networks that we need to, you know, to establish between, you know, between, between the youth. Um, and, and, and also with Messi Corps. We have a lot of history in working, in working with the youth. So we've partnered to create this program. That's going to provide opportunities for about 25,000 in the next three years. We believe that in testing this model, the first three years is phase one, is really proof of concept. Once this proof of concept is established, we're scaling that, and we have great ambitions to get it to have 500,000 youth empowered by 2020. So just like our women empowerment program, which we focused on, 5 million women by 2020, this is specifically focused on the youth and focused on this challenge that we face, which is lots of youth that need empowerment, that need you know, the right skills and opportunities, access to opportunities in order to, in order to make progress in, in communities. So, so um, building on some of that issue, again, the public-private partnership theme is there. Mark, from your perspective, Gates has done a lot in both public and private health and education in Africa. Is there still too much of a, and if it's not an ideological divide, is it a, a divide around misunderstanding to, to push forward some of this, some of this work in, around blended finance? Yeah, well, maybe um, bringing that question back to the earlier point you, you raised before you took it to the floor, which is saying we all sound very optimistic. Is there not a great shortage of, of capital investment in Africa? Where clearly there are massive shortfalls of, of capital investment in Africa. And Sim described, you know, there's the domestic reinvestment at whatever is 22%. There are shortages of international capital. There are lots of productive opportunities. But what there are are sort of a number of challenges. There's still a premium that by and large African investments are not required, but the markets impose on, on Africa by and large, even when the investments are relatively productive by global standards. That becomes exacerbated when you're dealing in areas such as the ones we tend to, to move into, which deal with, uh, again, poorer people and poorer communities and about partnering often with governments about deeper investment, the, the human capital problem that was raised earlier. And so I think there's the short answer to your question about, you know, is there still a divide, is there's much less of a divide than there used to be in terms of a willingness, I think, in terms of governments, international donors, partners like us, the private sector, to find ways to pool and use capital productively against particular outcomes. There's still, and why we use the word model advisedly, is there's still, they're not always great examples of how to do that. And so, you know, the shifts of what the governor is talking about, you know, improving the ease of doing business is clearly one important tool and lever to do that. Creating some of the types of partnerships so you can see how those operate uh, is another of the kinds that, you know, we've been talking about uh, here. And then um, the third element, and I think this is part of what you know, the World Economic Forum uh, aspires to, and I think actually the dialogues that have happened here, say, at WEF Africa over the last five, six, seven years, have helped draw and pull some of these issues together is how do you then turn these into longer term at scale types of investments? Uh, the, there's one level of scale which we do already reach which is in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands and that's important. But in Africa we're talking about the millions and tens of millions of people that, that still need those opportunities of the youth in Nigeria or wherever it might be. And, and that's where I think we're hopefully on the cusp. I tend to be an optimist about the models. but We've got the willingness of the various parties to come together around this, but we haven't yet been able to implement that at scale. So, so unfortunately, we're, we're drawing very much to the end. I want to put you all on the spot a little bit. Um, in, 
in the middle of July in Addis, um, world leaders are going to collect for the financing for development uh, conference. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't talked very much about the official development sector, but at that conference, uh, and it will, be, it will, it will have as a, a parallel conference, a business conference. If I push you to say two things that you think would make the greatest difference coming out of that conference to your work on the ground or to the issue of catalyzing capital for Africa, what would it be? Governor, let's start with you. And this has to be very quick fire. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think one is we, we've done the last uh, few decades with government financing focusing on uh, government projects and in fact at first focusing on social pro programs implemented by government. I think we need to move a step further where, uh, and somehow started in some uh, development finance institutions, <coughs> where we can leverage this development financing to crowd in private sector financing. Uh, I think that's key how we can, that's the branding of the financing uh, as we are saying. I remember discussing with the African Development Bank about two, three years ago on how maybe the allocation they give to Rwanda, instead of using it as, uh, as just money spent on a given project, we can use it as a guarantee to bring in private sector uh, investment in our, in our country. So how we, 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 we that partnership between government, the private sector, and the development partners uh, coming together to, to really, uh, re in most cases, you, you have one <coughs> official financing can bring in like a three units of private financing. If we can really have that sort of uh, architecture thought of and developed, that could bring in more, more capital to, to finance development in our countries. I, I think that's really key. Okay. Guarantees, and, and I, think, I think some of that will incidentally be on the table in, in Addis. Okay. Okay. Nathan, you have only about um, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. You know, I, I believe that you know, a focus on infrastructure development <coughs> in Africa is, is, is a big, big opportunity for us to accelerate growth and attract foreign direct investment and attract local investment. It is a big delta, and I believe that our continent can add a number of points of growth by just increasing and improving the rail networks we have, communication, electricity. If you look at the potential of just having effective electricity supply across Africa, and the multiplier effect of that across industries, if you think about the formal and the informal sector, is incredible. So I think that would be something that I would like to see out of this conference. How do we garner development finance that will allow us to strengthen our infrastructure? Because that's basically, at the end of the day, the backbone of industry. Without infrastructure that works, it's very difficult to run a business that competes internationally. And that infrastructure may need the, the guarantees that the mm. governor has been talking about. Yeah. Mark? Well, I think uh, really building on what's been said, <coughs> it's these conferences, and it's not the first financing for developed conference, tend uh, for political reasons often to degenerate into discussions about the role of aid, the obligations of the West versus the obligations of developing countries. And I think the real opportunity of this conference is to make it a truly 21st century discussion about development finance, which is exactly the theme we've been discussing. How can these different pools of capital come together, public, private, philanthropic, and others, against very core development outcomes that are going to be self-sustaining and generating growth, whether it's infrastructure, human capital, and, and other investments? Thank you. Sam? I would, I would resolve to stop the trend towards financial balkanization of the countries, and I would accelerate uh, uh, at the free trade area. Okay, a very ambitious agenda, I have to say. Um, <coughs> before we end, I wanted to invite up Terry Toyota, who leads the WEF's uh, Blended Finance um, Initiative, to just say a little few words about where we are now on that initiative. 30 Terry. seconds, I got the message. <laughs> So thank you all for a very rich discussion. But what we often hear is what happens next and how do I engage in this very relevant topic. 
And so as Caroline mentioned, the World Economic Forum is institutionally committed to this topic of blended finance. But what does that mean? It means, as Mark said, identifying and amplifying some of those creative models that you are using in your institutions and in your countries and bringing those to scale or, where possible, replicating them to other sectors or geographies. Additionally, we are looking at new solutions and new forms of partnerships for where areas that there are still gaps and for breaking through some of those barriers that the governor also highlighted. And perhaps at a more fundamental level, working on knowledge products such as this primer which we're just releasing that actually help to bridge some of the uh, language barriers because blended financing by definition brings in such diverse audiences and sometimes it's actually a matter of just <coughs> speaking a common language and we found that very, a very practical issue to solve. So just to mention that this is an initiative of the, the World Economic Forum in collaboration with the OECD, uh, Gates, Canada, many others are participating quite actively in it. So would encourage you to, to let me know if you're interested in um, being a part of this and moving this forward with an aim, as we all know, to closing some of those financing gaps and making more better uh, social and economic progress. I have to give a plug for our transformation maps. These were launched in uh, the annual meeting in Davos in 2015. There's a booth on it. Basically, they show how the pieces in this multi-stakeholder environment really connect on development finance or blended finance. So thank you very much for all of your participation. Thank you, Caroline, and to all of the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all panelists.